Sí. Coffee with Dan. Every weekday, 8 a.m. onwards on Radio Sri Lanka. Listen to Radio Sri Lanka 97.4 and 97.6 island wide for Coffee with Dan. You're listening to Radio Sri Lanka and it's time for Coffee with Dan. Over to you, Dan. Good morning and welcome to Coffee with Dan. This morning, I have with me Mr. David North. He's the international editor, uh, editorial, he's uh, chairman of the inter- international editorial board of the World Socialist website. So before I go into much details, I would like to welcome and good morning to Mr. David North. Nice to be here, Dan. Thank you for inviting me. David North comes from United States of America, and as I mentioned, that he's a chairman of the International Editorial Board of the World Socialist Web. He's down in Sri Lanka to address some important events, and he addressed on the 1st of uh, uh, October a media conference in Colombo on forthcoming public meetings to commemorate the 80th anniversary of the founding of the 4th International and the 50th anniversary of the Socialist Equality Party, or what they call the SEP, in Sri Lanka. And also he spoke at Peradeni University last weekend and at Newtown Hall on October 7th. So now, uh, first of all, let me ask uh, you, David, uh, what is this World Socialist website all about? Uh, The World Socialist website is the uh, internet publication of the International Committee of the Fourth International. It is, as an internet site, published globally in approximately 15 languages. It is the most widely read uh, Marxist socialist website in the world. It's posted six days a week, and uh, this year we marked the 20th anniversary of continuous uh, publication. It follows a wide range of political social, economic, uh, historical, theoretical, cultural issues. And uh, <clears throat> I think it, uh, you know, it has a, a very uh, substantial worldwide audience. So what made you to come to Sri Lanka? Well, uh, I was invited uh, to Sri Lanka by the Socialist Equality Party uh, of Sri Lanka, which is the Sri Lankan section of the International Committee of the Fourth International. Uh, the... Uh, SEP here in Sri Lanka was uh, is celebrating its 50th anniversary. Of course, uh, everyone who is a, uh, a Trotskyist knows that uh, there is a long and uh, proud history of uh, Marxism in Sri Lanka. And uh, this has been represented by the Revolutionary Communist League, which was founded in 1968 and then which became in the 1990s the Socialist Equality Party. So... Uh, the SEP and its general secretary, Vijay Diaz, invited me to come to Sri Lanka to lecture on the uh, historical lessons of the 80 years of the Fourth International. The Socialist Equality Party, or what you call the SEP, emphasizes that the working class need to study study the history of the Fourth International and International Committee on the Fourth uh, International. In your speeches, too, you have highlighted this as profound significance. Can you explain why history of your movement is so important for the revolutionary revolutionary transformation of the global order? Well, first of all, to understand the past, we have to have a historical reference point. How can we understand the many complicated problems of our time? without understanding how we arrived here. Uh, The struggle for socialism in the 20th century assumed monumental proportions. The Russian Revolution of 1917 saw the establishment of the first worker state in history. But that revolution, which founded the Soviet Union, underwent a terrible degeneration under Stalin. All the fundamental principles upon which that revolution was based, above all the international unity of the working class, the fight for genuine socialist democracy and equality, uh, 
All of these were betrayed by Stalin uh, with catastrophic consequences culminating in the dissolution of the Soviet Union itself. Now, in the aftermath of the dissolution of the USSR, uh, the claim was made that we were, had arrived at the end of history, that uh, capitalism had triumphed, liberal democracy was the last stage in human history. There was, in fact, a very well-known book called The End of History by Francis Fukuyama. And uh, we were all told that uh, we were entering into a new age of peace, uh, prosperity, and equality. As it turns out, the world that has developed over the last 30 years is anything but that. We live in a world of inequality, of economic crisis, growing danger of fascism, and the imminent threat of war. Uh, no one who follows world politics seriously can doubt that the conflict between the United States and China and Russia, the growing militarization which we see in countries throughout the world, uh, is heading in a potentially very tragic and catastrophic direction. Now, there is a renewal of interest in socialism among broad sections of youth, among growing numbers of workers, even and especially in the United States, which may come as a surprise for those who only know the United States as the citadel of capitalism. But such are the conditions which exist, that there is a real desire for an alternative. Capitalism is becoming a dirty word again. And so there's a great interest in an alternative. <clears throat> but the immediate problem which arises is that the younger generation, uh, in fact, most people today, uh, have very little knowledge of the history of the socialist movement, of the great struggles which determine the fate of socialism. And so the question of socialism remains very abstract. It is really necessary to educate and uh, explain the great struggles through which the working class passed, the great struggles which shaped the socialist movement, and there is no struggle more important than the struggle waged by the Trotskyist movement against Stalinism and all its variants, including Maoism. So if you want to understand the world today, you have to study it through the prism of these enormous experiences. And the greatest political thinker of the 20th century was Leon Trotsky. He's also the most slandered, the most calumniated of all figures. Uh, <clears throat> but the, this history is of immense significance. And so I uh, was invited here to Sri Lanka to review the major experiences of the last century and explain their relevance to the present period. So the Social Equality Party and your part, World Party, the International Committee, in a series of documents, characterized trade unions playing a reactionary role since the lapse of the post-World War boom period in 1960s and when production was increasingly globalized. There are also reports to say that globally, especially in USA and UK, the trade unions have been losing their memberships. At the same time, new forms of populist movements and that working class and devising from their traditional representatives and forming new forms of protest. Also in Sri Lanka, we see that sometimes uh, the, the trade union actions have been sometimes quite... Uh, uh, disturbing to the general public as well. But now, considering the fact that Fuk uh, the, the, the Fukuyama and also the China uh, uh, ident uh, 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 you know, the WSWS has shown the so-called pseudo-left has taken the lead in these protest politics. So my question I would like to Post to you is why have you and the ICFI characterized their these political forms as political traps to the working class? Well, there are many issues raised in your question. I'll try to deal with a few of them. First of all, on the question of the trade unions, uh, these organizations have undergone over the last half century a staggering degeneration. Uh, none of the functions with which unions were traditionally associated attempt to raise wages, improve working conditions, defend workers on the job. And none of these fundamental basic functions are even uh, carried out today by unions. They have been so completely integrated into the structure of corporate management. Now, the basic 
cause of this is not to be found in simply the bad characters of those who lead it, but rather in the fact that in the final analysis, uh, these organizations base themselves on essentially a national program, uh, a national uh, strategy. This requires, however, that they subordinate themselves to the policies of their own ruling elites. Uh, today, uh, I'm, you told me from before you're a very experienced economist. Uh, you will uh, know that uh, the dominant uh, factors in the world today are international. We live in a globally integrated economy. Every capitalist class uh, and state is involved in a ferocious competition for dominance. The most ruthless of all is the United States. And so within this framework, a national policy is absolutely inadequate. Uh, the ruling elites demand that the workers more and more submit themselves to the requirements of the trade wars that they're waging, that they provide <coughs> cheap labor so their goods are competitive. So the uh, basic failure of the unions, and I would say all the formally reformist parties, is that they have no answer within a national policy to this international crisis. The capitalists tried to solve this problem through war through trade war, through economic warfare, ultimately through military conflict. Uh, the working class must put forward a very different approach, which transcends the national state. Now, as far as the question of the pseudo-left concerns, I, we use the term pseudo-left not as an exaggeration, but as a factually correct statement that these organizations, uh, which call themselves left, in no way uphold anything which would have been associated with Marxism. And I'll just focus on one fundamental question. The central strategical foundation of Marxism is the recognition of the revolutionary role of the working class, the international character of the working class. <clears throat> All of the great work of Marx and Engels was devoted to establishing that and also to uh, uh, demonstrate that uh, the class struggle is the foundation of history, and yet that's been replaced by something called identity politics, which the uh, pseudo-left organizations promote, which reject class as the fundamental division and promote all sorts of secondary questions, uh, gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity. All of these are put forward as an alternative uh, to the unity of the working class, and it does this in a manner which is extremely destructive and which reflects, <clears throat> if I may be frank, not the interests of the working class, but the interests of a certain segment of the upper middle class, which uses fights over identity to lay claim at a greater share of the wealth at the top of society. That is, if I'm of a certain identity, I can claim a privileged position. Socialism doesn't seek privileges for anybody. Socialism seeks equality, and it seeks the equality of all the working people. And it seeks the unity of the working class. So we oppose uh, the type of politics of the, of the pseudo-left, which <clears throat> is uh, very heavily promoted in the universities and uh, increasingly uh, in among segments of the uh, capitalist state itself, as we see in the United States. It's become a mechanism for organizing people on a quite right-wing basis. <coughs> Excuse me. Now you stated uh, you previously stated that Leon Trotsky's uh, 1938 document uh, titled "Death Agony of Capitalism" and the task of the Fourth International is still valid today. Could you explain on that? Yes, yeah, so Trotsky used the term to describe the world epoch as that of capitalism's death agony. He wasn't talking about the 24-hour virus. He was talking about a profound and uh, terminal illness of the social order. He wrote that on the eve of World War II against the backdrop of fascism, the breakdown of bourgeois democracy all over the world, rampant economic crisis. And uh, the, what followed immediately in the aftermath of the founding of the Fourth International, the outbreak of World War II, one year later, the uh, horrific slaughter which then followed, certainly vindicated uh, Trotsky's analysis of the world situation. In the aftermath of the war, and now it's a very protracted process we're following and talking about, capitalism uh, with the assistance of Stalinism and with the assistance of the treacherous policies of the Soviet bureaucracy managed to stabilize itself. 
And this led many people to believe that somehow Trotsky's uh, evaluation of uh, capitalism was draconian, was exaggerated. But Trotsky, if you examine his writings carefully, made the point that uh, the crisis which he was speaking of was of an epical character. There could be periods of recovery, periods of uh, relative peace, but these, he said, would be temporary. It's like an illness which goes into remission. You know, when someone has cancer and their illness goes into remission, one always has in the back of one's mind the fact that at some point this disease will return. And this is the situation we face today. Uh, all the fundamental contradictions which were not resolved in the 20th century, the problem of the national state and world economy, the problem of the growth of the productive forces counterposed to private ownership, None of these problems have been solved, and they now reemerge in really virulent form. And uh, so it would seem that Trotsky's uh, metaphor of the death agony is profoundly appropriate to our time. I mean, I've recently been in Germany. It has not been adequately covered in the world press, but there is a serious resurgence of neo-Nazi politics in Germany, all the more dangerous because the Nazis have substantial influence in the German state. This is finally being acknowledged in the world media. It's something we've been pointing out for the last five years. We've been noting that there's been a revision of history in the German academic community to go so far as apologize and justify Hitlerism. And now you have the resurgence of neo-Nazi demonstrations. Now here we are 72 years after the, 73 years after the end of the Second World War, talking about the reality of Nazism as a threat in Germany. Now, how can one explain this? It would mean that uh, the ghosts that one thought might have been buried are, in fact, very much alive. They're reemerging. And so we have to turn to a more serious evaluation to look at politics, not from the standpoint of just day-to-day -day events, but to place ourselves in a broader epoch, where are we in history? And uh, the answer which we provide is a historically grounded answer, that we are at a very advanced stage of this death agony of the capitalist system. And if the working class fails to find a socialist solution to the crisis, uh, the solution of the capitalist will be uh, dictatorship and war. So that's... Uh, the, uh, uh, the main element, and I, I think there's great interest in this. Uh, again, I encounter, the problem today is not an absence of interest in, in, in socialism. That's very different. And uh, in America, the land you know, where anti-communism, anti-socialism became a sort of state religion, uh, the uh, credibility of that is breaking down. The reality is too graphic, youth experience, unemployment, the difficulties of even starting a, a family, student debt, uh, the reality of uh, a creature like Donald Trump ascending to the presidency, and uh, the inability of the so-called opposition to present any progressive alternative. I mean, if I can just turn briefly to the subject of American politics, people often ask me about what's happening to the United States, and people, <clears throat> you know, of course, rightfully despise everything Trump stands for, and all over the world, he's viewed as a uh, truly monstrous figure with his reckless threats against nations and peoples. But I say to them that uh, Trump is a symptom of a deeper disease. And if they believe uh, that uh, things would be uh, fundamentally different if the Democratic Party came to power, they're making a grave mistake. Uh, Trump is only an extremely brutal expression of... Uh, deeper tendencies in American uh, political life. Uh, unfortunately, in politics, people tend to have a short memory. Let us keep in mind that America has been almost continuously at war uh, since 1990 when it first invaded Iraq. Then we've had the war on terror, which has now gone on for uh, 17 years. And even now, the military acknowledges that the purpose of this war on terror is essentially to assure American geopolitical dominance. And uh, it's directed uh, against uh, China. It's directed against Russia. And in the final analysis, the disputes that find expression in American politics between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are 
over tactical issues. Uh, Trump seems to be promoting very aggressively his anti-China politics. The Democratic Party is more focused on an anti-Russia politics. They would have everyone believe that somehow uh, Putin and uh, with a bit of, uh, I think, a total of $100,000 spent on Facebook determined the outcome of the American election. I mean, that is obviously absurd. But the differences which they have are not over the question of war itself, not over the question of the dominance of the United States, not over the question of its aggressive global policies, let alone on the question of uh, pursuing the interests of the capitalist class of the United States. Their differences are purely tactical on those questions, but it certainly is uh, they're fighting a, a battle over geopolitical strategy. What, who should they go to war against first? And uh, for the working class, this is not, uh, we, we have uh, no interest in pursuing these, uh, frankly, uh, reactionary uh, and really even criminal uh, ambitions. Uh, no country should dominate any other country. And uh, the answer is not uh, to be found in uh, so-called wars against terror, which are fictional, but in the development of the revolutionary struggle of the working class throughout the world against militarism. This morning in Coffee with Dan, I have Mr. David North, who is the chairman of the International Editorial Board of the World Socialist website. And we are talking about the Social Equality Party and the, um, the World uh, Union uh, leading this uh, particular party. Uh, form of uh, the socialist movement. Now, uh, David, uh, turning back to our discussion, now China being the second largest economy, you know, is fast developing its influence in the Asian and African region. It even grants huge development loans to underdeveloped countries. And Sri Lankan uh, community also has a lot of concern here with China. Uh, China is blamed for fixing debt traps on these countries. Uh, and then taking control of weak governments. Washington Post on August 27, I believe, blamed China's debt trap around the world and named it as the trademark of its imperialist ambition. Is China an imperial state? Well, I'll come back to that question in a moment. I, I must say, though, if I, speaking as an American, I find it rather hypocritical, if not absurd for the United States to be accusing anybody of imperialist ambitions. I mean, I don't think that anyone who's familiar with American economic policy in the so-called third world would uh, claim that the United States has followed an altruistic uh, agenda. When America has given money, it has always done so from the standpoint of achieving its objectives. It intervenes in elections all over the world. It uh, influences, not only influences governments, it overthrows them uh, when they're not satisfied with uh, the policies they're pursuing. And I suspect that uh, the uh, anger which the United States has, for example, directed against China over the recent loan, which just was announced over the just last few days, is not because uh, America is trembling for the... Uh, uh, fate of the people of Sri Lanka, that it is uh, terrified by the prospect of imperialism influencing uh, Sri Lanka. What they're really concerned about is the fact that uh, Sri Lanka is seen as geostrategically very, very significant. The location itself is one which is of vast potential military significance. If the United States chose to block China's access uh, to its trade routes uh, in the uh, Asia-Pacific region, and of course the South Indian Ocean is one of the most critical uh, junctures for trade today. Uh, China's influence in Sri Lanka is viewed as potentially harmful to that strategy. Uh, that being said, uh, <clears throat> uh, the policies pursued by uh, China themselves, directed by what they perceive to be the national interests, but not just na national interests of the ruling elite. Uh, the tragedy of China is that while it has undoubtedly made immense economic uh, progress, no one can be unmindful of that, uh, they're now coming up against the fact that they are a belated entry into the sphere of global 
geopolitics. Uh, the United States will use all of its resources to block their development. I've read countless papers, I'm sure you're familiar with them as well, in which the United States uh, says that if things continue as they have for the, la for the next 10, 15, 20 years, uh, China will be the dominant power, and the United States is determined to stop that. And uh, that leads to war. So the policy of China, since China adopted uh, capitalist policies, abandoned a socialist orientation, uh, China has now uh, finds itself in an extremely dangerous situation. It cannot find on the basis of capitalist development, notwithstanding its undoubted economic gains, a uh, viable solution uh, because uh, the path along capitalist lines is, is war. And so the question for the Chinese masses is uh, a fight against uh, capitalist policies. It has to have the defense of China against imperialism, which is a very real danger. The attempt, for example, within China to stir up ethnic and linguistic differences, as they do everywhere in the world, the imperialists, uh, that can only be counted on the basis of a revolutionary socialist policy. Uh, so, <clears throat> no, I, I, don't, uh, I don't accept the definition of China as an imperialist country. I think this is a, uh, a simplification of a much more complicated historical process. I think uh, uh, China certainly has become a capitalist country, uh, but uh, it finds itself within sort of a framework of global imperialist policies, uh, which uh, cannot be uh, overcome uh, within that framework. In other words, uh, the Chinese working class has to find its way back to socialism, but it can only do so through a merciless critique of what the Maoist regime was. Maoism was a form of Stalinism. And uh, the restoration of uh, capitalism in China uh, was uh, undertaken by a bureaucracy. I, I think it should be pointed out that it came, it was accelerated in the aftermath of Tiananmen Square when it suppressed the opposition of the working class and students. So I, you know, we take we tend to take a much more historical approach to these questions, not a short-term journalistic approach. The questions of the Chinese Revolution, unification of its people, independence from imperialism. This is posed today in a far more advanced ways. It's now the unification of the masses of Asia, and uh, the world, and that's not going to be found within the framework of, I mean, China's attempt to buy allies here and there and everywhere is not going to solve its historical problem. Now, we know that China being a communist uh, country and then later well, start, yes. And, I, and it never was truly socialist, and it never was communist, it was Stalinist, and uh, that resulted in a profound perversion of uh, uh, socialist policy. But later it uh, opened up the markets and became a uh, neo-capitalist country, but uh, some uh, may see this as uh, not really an imperialist uh, approach like you very correctly mentioned now. But however, how does its global character differ from other imperialist countries? Again, it's, it's, it, it, it has a very different history. I don't think when one examines uh, a country, one can do so without examining it's, it's historical development, uh, but when then, in the absence of a historical approach, one is sort of thrown back on making superficial comparisons. I mean, the United States emerged as an imperialist country uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century. That was a sort of global phenomena that was sort of noted by increasing number of economists at this time, and uh, the, it was bound up with the process of uh, uh, colonialization. Uh, the battle among uh, major uh, banking concerns, the state as uh, an instrument of the monopoly of finance capital. Now, no doubt, uh, China, uh, you might say, exhibits certain features to the extension of its financial influence, but you can't really, on the basis of the experience of just the last 25 years, uh, uh, explain these phenomena. I mean, I think the... When I hear the term imperialist used against China, and I must again stress, I'm not speaking as a defender of Chinese foreign policy. I'm anything but that. When the term is used, particularly 
among pseudo-left organizations, and they say China is imperialist. They do so, or they also say uh, Russia is imperialist, or Iran is imperialist. Generally, it's bound up with their support for the foreign policy of the United States. And uh, I always ask, if, I, if you have me agree, I already oppose the foreign policy of China, but if you have me agree to this definition, what are the implications? And it generally turns out that they want me then to agree, or they want people who adopt that position to accept uh, the right of self-determination for all sorts of ethnic linguistic minorities in China. In other words, it becomes an instrument for the breaking up of China, which would be a profoundly reactionary process. Uh, <clears throat> so I think that, uh, again, I know it may sound very complicated when one speaks about this, particularly in a radio interview, and one's trying to deal with many issues in a short period of time. Uh, the, the imposition of a simplistic definition does injustice to reality. That being said, uh, it by no means implies that we agree with or support the foreign policy of China. The foreign policy of China is dictated in the final analysis by the interests of an emerging capitalist class. China is minting billionaires at a rather rapid clip. Uh, it's not a foreign policy which serves the interests of workers. It's a foreign policy which, by its very logic, leads to confrontation with Japan, leads to confrontation with the United States, with India. Uh, all of this has catastrophic consequences. So if socialists want to find a way out of this nightmarish logic of national state competition. And uh, that can only be found on the basis of socialist internationalism, through the building of a foreign policy based on the interests of the global working class. I know it can often be very hard to understand that and appear, oh, this is unrealistic. In fact, it's the, if one's talking about the survival of the planet, it's the only realistic foreign policy. Let me ask you, in conclusion, the Socialist Equality Party has a youth movement as well. The International Youth and Students for Social Equality, or what you call the IYSSE, what is this program, uh, or what is the program your party is adv uh, advancing to the youth against education, privatize, ed education privatization, welfare cuts, and unemployment? Because in Sri Lanka, we are having major, major issues in these regards. And as I mentioned to you uh, at the beginning of this um, Coffee with Dan, uh, it sometimes become a public nuisance to the country. Well, I think uh, the, the problems of the youth all over the world are uh, uh, so severe. Uh, and I think that's one thing I, I, uh, which really needs to be stressed. I, I have had the privilege of coming to Sri Lanka over now three decades. It's just over 30 years since I first visited Sri Lanka. And there have been obviously immense changes, social changes, cultural changes. You've also gone through a very tragic experience of, of civil war and I must point out I'm very proud to be associated with the party which opposed all forms of ethnic chauvinism whether it's in Hala or uh, Tamil and fought for the unity of all uh, national and ethnic groupings and religious groupings in Sri Lanka but the point I want to stress in response to your question is that the problems of the youth are international problems uh, the Global crisis of capitalism is, interna is international. The problem, uh, the lack of access to education, uh, decent jobs, livable wages, a future, the universal threat of war is one which face youth all over the world. So the IYSSE, the youth movement of the socialist equality parties, uh, has a perspective of... Uh, uniting youth on the basis of a socialist program. It's called the International Youth and Students for Social Equality because equality is the basic principle of socialism. And uh, youth look at a world in which your status is determined above all by the family into which you are born. If your family is rich, that essentially uh, solves your economic problems. It may create other, other problems for you, moral problems, cultural problems, but uh, uh, the fact is the allocation of possibilities and opportunities is determined above all by the wealth of your family. And most young people, the great overwhelming mass of the world's youth, uh, confront poverty, the threat of poverty. 
uh, have few opportunities, and that is true whether you're talking about Sri Lanka, India, Germany, the United States, Latin America. And so <clears throat> we are putting forward a, a revolutionary program, and uh, for that very reason, I think now, as young people in ever greater numbers express interest in socialism, uh, it becomes immensely important to provide them with an education in socialist theory, in history. I, I, I find that much of my time is spent giving historical lectures. I, I don't see this as a distraction from politics. I think today it's the very essence of politics. Uh, politics needs, uh, has to be grounded on history. Uh, and uh, when people say they are interested in practical politics, not uh, in, uh, in history, I say such people are not engaged in serious politics at all. This morning in Coffee with Dan, I had Mr. David North. He's the chairman of the International Editorial Board of the World Socialist website. He has come down to Sri Lanka for a very important event to address the forthcoming public meetings to commemorate the 80th anniversary of the founding of the 4th International and the 50th anniversary of the Socialist Equality Party or the SEP in Sri Lanka. And in Coffee with Dan, we spoke about the social equality party as well as the working class in a socialist movement thank you very much david for being this morning in coffee with dan and special in sri lanka well, thank you dr dan for having me here it was a pleasure